Okay. For the second for the second panel, Latin America in 2022, from Chatham House and Mex so Mexi, we welcome Ricardo Montreal, Senator Ricardo Montreal. For those of you who are in this house, he is very famous, very well known, and he is now, he's in the Senate and he is also the head of political coordination for this uh, period of uh, time and events. It is a, he is a person who has held positions which uh, I'm sure and uh, I do share the thought of how we are living the political reality in Mexico. He understands this well. He also has uh, broad experience uh, um, in politics, he has been a senator and a representative for several years. He is a delegate here in the uh, Colonia Cuauhtémoc. When we had uh, a few years back uh, delegations instead of mayorships, uh, <clears throat> and he has ex much experience in uh, Latin American affairs. <coughs> Also in this panel, we have Luis Rubio, who is also very well known by you. And we were saying upstairs that on Sundays, when one wakes up in the morning after breakfast and uh, coffee, what uh, we do first and foremost, we hear Mr. Rubio and uh, also uh, the uh, caricature of uh, Calderon, and Luis is a very well-known uh, political analyst here in Mexico. He holds the uh, presidency, the chair of Mexico Evalua. He was the chair of Comexi for four years uh, prior to our president, uh, Jorge Alcocer, and he's a very good friend of ours. The idea <coughs> is, excuse me, is to see how the internal political pressures inside the region affect or reflect on the international relations or affairs on the other regions and the one's own region. <coughs> what has happened in these past few years with the role of Latin America and the Caribbean in the international scenario has been affected directly by the internal uh, policies and politics of the governments uh, in turn uh, in who are working at the time in Mexico. It is said that the best foreign policy <laughs> is the internal policy or uh, domestic policy. For me, this is not how I think. I think that both have their own dynamics. And certainly, there is an interrelationship in existence between these two aspects. So we are going to speak with uh, uh, Mr. Monreal and with Luis today. And we would like to see how the relevance of the region has been affected within the uh, international mm -hmm. context in, in Latin America. Many of the countries of the region uh, took part in the founding of the United Nations organization. And I would think, uh, the, and that I, I'm right, that we have had an important presence in the international <laughs> sphere. And uh, I ask uh, myself, do we have a voice that is listened to? And I would also like to take advantage of the time that we have to talk about two junctural issues. The summit of the Americas that somehow we touched upon previously and the invasion of Russia on the Ukraine, and how the region has uh, reacted to this uh, reality. So I thank you 
thank you very much for being here, Luis. And we are going to listen to Senator Monreal so that he can talk to us about this issue or whatever other issue he would like to discuss uh, regarding Mexico and what he sees uh, in the elections for the candidacies uh, for presidency for the presidency in 2024. Thank you very much. Ricardo. Thank you. I want to thank the organizers and Comexi, also Chatham House. I'm very happy to uh, find uh, uh, Andres one more time. He is a leader in diplomatic uh, relations. Uh, he's very well known. He's very much admi admired by us. And I'm very happy to share this panel with uh, Luis Rubio, who's a friend, a colleague. We've known one another for a long time. And also with uh, Rebecca, who will be joining us, I think, uh, uh, digitally. I think that I, I should have announced this. Uh, Rebecca uh, said she couldn't be here one or two days ago be sh because she had another engagement, uh, so she will not be joining us. This well, this uh, happens in the best of families, I know. <laughs> so uh, we can talk uh, uh, without her presence, but uh, I would like to talk with her very much. The uh, Senate of the country, as in many other places of the world, has become one uh, a, a chamber of, uh, for discussions uh, and the place where we have uh, had a, the meetings of the Senate for 200 years in America. And it was conceived initially as a chamber in order to be able to cover and uh, to stop uh, the, the problems that would be coming from the uh, House of Representatives. The Senate is an uh, agency that is uh, in charge of overlooking the, what happens in policies in general, especially in international politics. So this comes to mind because that uh, we have uh, the uh, presidency uh, that I have held, uh, the presidency of the directing board uh, at currently. And uh, as we know, Mexico is uh, undergoing a transition of uh, politics. And I think the transition of politics will not come to an end uh, at the end of the administration, this will last for much more because political changes take a longer time in reaching uh, maturity. These transitions in the past have been very painful, have certainly had casualties, and had Mexico has uh, followed a, a smooth uh, uh, trans period throughout the years. And uh, a few minutes ago in our previous panel, we were speaking with Jorge, and uh, we thank him for hosting us, and uh, from Sergio. And we were talking about the different situations in the country. And he was speaking to us about the transition, uh, fiscal aspects, the rec recuperation period uh, after the pandemic, uh, which uh, brought on so many casualties uh, these months without forgetting or setting aside the uh, problem with inflation, uh, because we know it's going to have consequences. And I am very much aware of the situation in, Amer in the Americas. I am convinced there is a need for the creation of union, union and unity uh, between and amongst the countries of the region. We are in a very difficult situation because of the uh, 
uh, as asymmetries that we find in the Americas, it will not be easy for us uh, to have the type of transition that the European Union had uh, or the Economic Commission for Europe had. These have been successful. These were successful. Mexico has uh, encountered many problems nonetheless. I think that the integration with the countries of uh, Latin America, with the Caribbean and the hemisphere, and I believe that we should all join together in efforts in order to be able to exchange uh, merchandise, people, culture, uh, and I think that we are on the right path. I think that uh, the president of the country has now turned his eyes towards this part of the uh, world. And I believe that Mexico can certainly be a, an important leader in this part of the world, in this continent. I do also believe that we are not strong enough to condition the issues that uh, are cropping up in the different parts of the world. I, I am not against the good relations, uh, good relationship with uh, the United States, and I'm ta referring to the summit uh, to take place uh, soon, and I will, uh, do not agree with the conditioning of the presence of Mexico if uh, other uh, countries of the region are not invited. I am referring to some, uh, the presence of some of the countries there due to their political processes. And um, although I see and understand their political stances, but I think that Mexico should not bet everything on uh, this condition and that Mexico should should have a very good relationship with the United States without any doubt Mexico should be a very good uh, social partner and uh, trade partner excuse me with Can Canada I know that the uh, the make the free trade agreement uh, uh, with uh, U.S. and Canada has uh, given way to uh, very good things, very good results. And right now we uh, are looking at the U.K. and separation from the uh, European Commission, and we are holding uh, treaties with other countries of the world. The Senate has certainly been an engine that has driven uh, the uh, things that have happened uh, through our diplomatic efforts. Uh, and this is what we do in the parliamentary meetings that we hold. This is what Mexico should keep on doing. Mexico should be the example for the South, and I can assure you that we have enormous advantages. Our geographic uh, advantage, which is an enormous advantage, and that uh, which we have mentioned about having, uh, being more competitive, being uh, <clears throat> technologically and, and scientifically more trained. I am in favor of training in uh, technology and science. I uh, bet uh, on robotics, on technology, on uh, uh, I, a, and I think that uh, I should mention climate change. This is an issue with the greatest importance that uh, takes up most uh, of our time and our work um, as uh, representatives and senators because we have to work. Uh, we have to put this issue on the agenda. Mexico should become a leader of clean energies and the leader of competitiveness after the uh, trade uh, with the United States, and that we should be leaders in manufactured goods, also in the transfer of science and technology 
and in some and issues where we have not been competitive and there is no one that had there is there's no country that has uh, replaced uh, uh, the presence of uh, china there is no one that has uh, covered the absence of the supply uh, to the united states uh, and the rest of the world and um, Mexico should be a leader in uh, these aspects. So I do believe in integration. But in that integration process, and in that integration itself, the United States should be there. Mexico is shouldn't be just looking at the south. It should be looking at the north. Our economy is uh, strong, not only here in the hemisphere, but uh, elsewhere, I wouldn't be looking only for the integration with the countries of the region. I would be looking at China and uh, UK, China, and of course the United States. The trade agreement says that uh, we should not have uh, any commercial tribes or trade uh, ties with China, but this is something I think I had 20 minutes to talk to you, and I think I have gone <laughs> behind that time. Uh, so I will uh, shortly give the microphone to Andres Rosenthal, because I, um, I, here I cannot abuse of your patience and your time frame. I will conclude here, and I'll be waiting for the second part of this discussion because I want to respect your laws and your rules. Luis, I would like to take advantage of your presence here and ask you about this idea mentioned by Monreal, this idea of uh, uh, President Lopez Obrador replacing the OAS with a sort of uh, Latin American Union, uh, which is similar to the European Union. I know that in the summit that will play, take place shortly in LA, which uh, was kicked off in 1964, with the idea of the United States of establishing a hemispheric integration. And since then, uh, I ask myself if this has happened or not. Thank you so very much for the opportunity, uh, Chatham House, and Comexi, and HSBC. I would like to uh, start my statements uh, in three ways. First, um, trade is uh, absolutely necessary. I don't know if that is uh, uh, something that we have to take into account and where the engine is find, found in exports. And there are no exceptions here. Uh, we are not trying to put any kind of physical barrier in the territory. And as the senator was saying, there is a, a division, a divorce in, in the Latin American integration purpose the political dynamics where we find the different expressions made by the citizens, their dislikes, their, uh, they're angry, their whatever, and there is a clear connotation of having tribes. And all of this takes us to having solutions that have been tested in Latin America when compared to Asia are not constructive. And they rarely lead to the solving of problems that motivate the rebellions of a political character. But since we cannot avoid the uh, world outside, the question is, how do we break this vicious cycle? How can we have more political realities which make more feasible <coughs> the systems that could, could help us to go through the pathway to correct uh, economic bridges. There are many claims by the citizens, claims that, uh, I ask myself, things, uh, uh, mm, political claims that could be feasible in our 
country. This is true of Latin America and the, in Mexico. We have not been able to reach these uh, uh, heights. The Mexico that we're living in Mexico is not the fault of anyone. We have not solved adequately. Technological change has uh, um, made the past uh, not the reality of today. So these are the things that sometimes give way to political um, changes. Have we changed the way and we have value added? Have we changed the productive uh, chains where we see that some countries only dedicate their time and efforts to the chain values, uh, value of chains, ex chains of values, excuse me. And so this is where we have to find how we can do the work. And this is something that takes me to say that the pandemic exacerbated. There are quick changes, attractive changes of governments. This is not only true of uh, Latin America, it's also true of the United States and other countries. Jorge Castaneda was saying that their uh, anti incumbency groups, uh, people, don't care whether the can candidates are left or right. This is not a matter of ideology. But this takes us to the reality of something that we wanted. If things worked, if something worked in the past, why do they not work now uh, currently? How do we solve things? In Mexico, the president has tried to uh, face all of these problems uh, with the uh, confrontation method. Mr. Monreal has no, is not always in agreement with what he says. Why? Because there are different ways to uh, handle problems and face them and solve them, not through confrontation. And we ask ourselves if these uh, problems are adequately being solved as the uh, government would like to see. And there are other series, there are, there is another series of problems. Not all of the answers are the same. Not all of the answers actually are responded in the same fashion because we know very well that uh, some ideas are not all the same since we don't have a uh, regional integration is because we have very similar Economies. Mexico is now an exception, but the economies of Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil were very similar in structure 30 years ago. Although we see that there are more complementary actions between Mexico and the United States, that the fate has not changed, that destination has not changed. There are other countries. Uh, that are much more closed up in their economic systems. Mm, we are different from Brazil and Argentina, not because we've made greater changes or different changes, but we have improved on the aptitudes that have actually allowed us to move along a certain path in a vehicle that has allowed us economic stability of Mexico, once opened in an alliance uh, with uh, North America, and here I agree with uh, Senator Monreal, and the project says that we should be glued to the U.S. always, and I don't think that this is right. We should have an integration towards the South, and there have been uh, plans, for example, as the Alliance of the Pacific that have helped for many uh, companies to uh, improve on the quality of their markets. And when the policy changes in a, in a, or politics change in one country, also the linkage pro uh, situation always takes place as well. Three years ago, with the pandemic came on, 
uh, we changed government in Venezuela and in, not in Venezuela, excuse me, in uh, Chile. And the ambassadors in Brazil and Venezuela had changed their discourse. Why? Because the one that they had a few weeks before that didn't work anymore, so they had to change. So this became a politicization of uh, economic situations with uh, integration capability. We know that in the Mexican government of today, much has been done to uh, break economic uh, reality with the United States. They have, it has done so. And uh, they say that uh, if that were the case, the, uh, the free trade agreement would have not been able to take place. And this is this is the reason why we have not been able to uh, uh, have a greater progress or breakthroughs. Mexico has done possible for the trade agreement to take place because it tells us that the interests are deeper than the ideologies, and their uh, economic consequences, which are political. Here, this has not uh, allowed for an important uh, regression throughout the entire region, including Mexico, institutionally speaking, in uh, uh, terms of economic growth and employment. And this creates very difficult uh, situations. And we can't, it's very difficult for us to plan towards the future uh, development-wise. Mr. Monreal has told us that this will take more time, and I think he's right. The risk is that uh, we will lose two generations of people that no longer were able to uh, take part in uh, economic growth. This has a dramatic social and political uh, result. Uh, because, uh, and of course I'm referring to the political reality that we are undergoing. We have to t touch upon that which is certainty. How can we build bridges of uh, understanding where the previous ones uh, are no longer wor working? When Trump came up, he uh, was a, a threat to the situation of uh, trade. Internally, we have to find a way to get to guarantees uh, with uh, bridges of trust, uh, uh, which are democratic and uh, hopeful. I think this is something that we should not uh, um, avoid. And now we have to see the context in which we are living today. It is more critical when we see competition between China and the United States, and we have to see the opportunity that lies before us. If we do not take advantage of this, this would be the third time that we have this circumstance when we approved uh, the trade agreement when China came uh, in uh, to its uh, trade agreement, and this has uh, caused the uh, Tremendous competition between the two zones. Mexico has a relationship with both of these countries, but this is a very strange type of relationship, especially with China, because there is a, no uh, real definition what the conflict is between the two countries. I think that the, the war against uh, Ukraine will take us to some uh, zones of influence as an author said, we took some vacation time uh, from the geopolitical scenario, and now we have to go back. Vacation time is over. We have to look more closely and follow what is happening in Ukraine. But that, of course, does not uh, mean that north-south uh, relationships uh, East-West relationships will continue, both the, due to geographical conditions and demographic conditions. We have to uh, straighten up the course to follow. This doesn't mean that we have to change things completely. We'll, to modify this, all we have to do is think about the new ways to have uh, economic growth 
better ways to uh, work uh, politically in, in the decision-making process, and all of this in uh, counter-current uh, fashion. We have to see those who uh, believe in the president and the other pressure that we have to face if, is to see what has happened in Mexico as if nothing had happened in a few years in the politics and decision-making processes in Mexico. Although there are new situations, the, we need to have new things uh, that we can use in Mexico. In Asia, they have been able to face the circumstances that uh, change implies, uh, especially in that which uh, refers to globalization. Why? Because they invested much more in education back then uh, than we did. And this is a central issue. The situation in Mexico has been more of a control, not so much as an aid to, uh, it hasn't helped to change social reality with social mobility. And uh, for the development of any country, I think that this is a great deficit that this re region has in uh, reality. Uh, we will be facing a period of time where we will have a chance to do much because a U.S. Uh, uh, government or administration is not noticing in depth all that is happening currently. There are things that we will have to see in the future. Maybe in 2024, we will see things more clearly also in the United States, not only in Mexico, because the geopolitical situation will change our future perspective. Gracias, Luis. Thank you, Luis. How can now? How can we correct our course? That is a sixty-four thousand pesos question. Actually, well, we live in a region of six hundred and sixty million inhabitants, and Mexico has a huge potential. But let's not forget that our exports now, 46% of these exports go to the U.S., 43%, 45%. And only 12% go to China in spite of the restrictions. Uh, if there were no restrictions, we would find ourselves between 30 or more percent with China. And with Asia, about 8%, 9%, that could be improved. What's our advantage? How can we correct uh, our course? I believe that education, science, technology, innovation, therein lies part of the solution. Mexico as a great challenge to meet ahead. But part of the population, 660 million inhabitants, they have a huge strip of utter poverty in the southern part of the region. And the concentration of poverty and uh, the, and the accumulation of goods is very high in the region. From January to June 2021, it was a difficult stage in the pandemic, and exports reached $600 million. 63% of our exports are manufactured, manufactured goods. And in oil products, mining products, we could be more competitive, by the way. And one of the surprises we were talking about it is the agro-exports uh, sector. It's amazing to see what's happening, although Luis was saying, yes, it could be Ricardo. 
It may be, but it is not being a benefit for the peasants in any way. It could be uh, the only sector that grew during the pandemic, the agro-exporting uh, sector. How can we correct that? The transition paths are just that, to perfect, uh, uh, to correct our course. And one of the main premises, one of the main uh, perspectives here, and I go back to what Louis said, we need juridical uh, guarantees. If we have no juridical or legal guarantees for the investors, our Achilles tendon will still be vulnerable. So not only a legal certainty, but also trust. I don't believe that uh, to attain these goals, we need to polarize, uh, confront, or tighten a sector and, and confront a sector of the population against another. To me, uh, the, uh, s the war of classes has already been overcome. So we still have some vulnerable sectors in poverty, but we need progressive um, concepts and principles to take them out of poverty so we can reach the same port, the same location without polarization. Polarization is used during the electoral political campaigns usually, and it is valid to have a contrast with one platform, with another platform, and a proposal, like right now in the six states where elections are being held. So it, it is uh, legitimate to have contrast and polarization and stress and strains. But I do think that we can reach the same destination through with um, negotiations between the sectors, listening to the sectors, incorporating their perspectives. Mexico is eager. Mexico has a great potential to attract uh, foreign investment. The number of people who want to invest in Mexico is huge, but they are being stopped by one thing. The question is, what will happen with my investment? If the law changes, since the party in the government has a majority in the upper and lower chamber and depend unconditionally from the president, what about my investment? If the rules of the game uh, through which I can invest now in Mexico, what happens if they ever change? And they're totally right. They're totally right. Well, half and half because. They're right halfway through because the country is built upon institutions. There is a federal judiciary branch that is truly autonomous out of the 11 ministries from the Supreme Court of Justice. They would tell them that maybe they don't agree with government. Nine out of them or seven out of them don't even agree with the government. At the chambers, upper chamber, lower chamber, you just saw it. It is not that easy. It is, and so not that easy that the electric reform did not go through. It required a constitutional majority, two-thirds, and the opposition as a bloc said that will never happen. And it, it, did, it, it, it was not adopted. And at the Senate, we, is, we have amended many laws that uh, meant to be adopted as they were drafted. And we said no. They need, we need to incorporate standards and mechanisms that may guarantee the juridical guarantee and looking after the national and foreign investments and also preserve the freedom of the individuals. That's what we have been doing at the Senate in such a way that 80% of the legislative products be they called constitutional reforms, international treaties agreements, ordinary law, uh, international agreements that have been tried out, 80% have been adopted unanimously. What does that mean? Well, it means they have been approved and adopted by all parties, every single party. And how did this happen? 
listening. By listening, we need to listen to the opposition and bear their uh, uh, opinions in mind to then devise uh, the rules of the game that will drive the destiny of the country. The only thing we have is hybrid products where everybody that are adopted by every single party. So that's why Andres's question is so important. That triggered by Luis. How can we uh, correct our course? Well, very easy. Rule of law, the rule of law. And everybody abiding by the law. Maybe they won't agree to the administration, to the style of the president. Oh, well, yeah, some do not agree to the president's style. But we have now a survey where 67% of approval rates. Uh, so a few days ago, I saw a survey from President Biden, 27% approval, V60% reproval. What's happening in Mexico currently? A uh, political transition process is going on. What will happen in Mexico? The, tr the political transition will be perfected. The election will not be easy. Far from it. Those who believe this has been solved are just wrong. Because I'll win. I will be winning. No, 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 no. Joke, joke. No. Those who think this is a day in the country, this is a picnic, well, don't, don't believe in that. Don't be naive. We still need time. But I see clearly what we have in the country, what's happening, how it's evolving. And we can get to the same port the president wants to get to by talking, negotiating, and reaching conciliations. We don't need to quarrel. A couple of days ago, you can do it. A couple, well, if you can travel to Dubai, I was invited by one of the Arab Emirates. We have seven Emirates, 50 years in the country, and in the national uh, a palace in Abu Dhabi, there is a quotation at the entrance of the national palace. It says, conciliation and moderation uh, lead to the stability and development of the peoples. Who said that? The founder of the Emirates. They were, it was the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, they considered the founder that convened the meeting of the seven Emirates to create these Emirates. I believe in this uh, quotation, conciliation, moderation, uh, provide the stability and development of the peoples. It's not that hard. Mexico faces great, great issues. Maybe the transition will not be that easy in 20, 2024, 2030. We will be facing insufficient revenues because although I agree with the social uh, policies of the president, you know, as many, of, uh, many other bankers, we don't have sufficient revenue to support the growing social subventions because we don't have any more revenues or any more activities to draw more revenue for the state. 90% of the budget has been allotted, labeled, and the great programs uh, from the president, the airport, Dos Bocas, Transismic, the Mayan train, of course, you need huge resources, additional record resources, and we are not uh, producing the foundation of this wealth. This is a serious issue. Whoever comes next will have to solve in the best way possible one of them, security. In spite of the fact that they may say, uh, like they can, uh, uh, but in the rest of the country, in the provinces, we have security problems, and we will also have health issues, education, employment, competitiveness. Those will be the issues. So it's not a promising landscape. 
and and it won't be no reward for whoever uh, will be at the front of the authorities. They will have to be intelligent, wise, and to be surrounded by the best elements from society, even if, as Louis said, they're not the acolytes. I'm not an acolyte. I'm an independent and autonomous man. Maybe that's why you think I'm cold and harsh and cold, but no problem. Thank you, Senator Luis. You said, rightly so, that the region shows uh, similarities in the problems, similar problems. So. All the, pro all the countries in the region suffer the same issues that have been mentioned by Senator Monreal. But apparently, we have different views and different takes on how to solve them. Senator Monreal said that one of the possible ways to correct and, solve and correct the course in Mexico solve the problems was to first uh, have a dialogue between the uh, politicians and the people, and second, trust uh, uh, legal certainty and the enforcement of the law equal for all. But these concepts are used during the political campaigns a great deal. We heard that during the campaign that is uh, being uh, undertaken in Brazil during the campaign in Chile that took uh, uh, President Boric to the presidential, presidential chair during the Peruvian campaign with Mr. Castillo and in the uh, campaign in Mexico uh, with Mr. Lopez Obrador when he was still campaigning. But the problem is once they reach the absolute power, all these politicians reach absolute power, the landscape becomes more complicated. They keep talking about the same thing, but they do not put it into practice this as they promised they would. So how do you view that, Luis? How about correcting the course? And in addition to the legal certainty, the rule of law, and so on and so forth. So, so what can we do? Because we also want this forum to bring to light some conclusions and also some recipes and to uh, determine the course when I was a secretary at the Mexican Ministry for Foreign Affairs, we made an account of the number of regional fora that Latin America and the Caribbean have, have created in the past 50 years and held in the past 50 years. We have more fora and more institutions and more attempts uh, than any other region in the world, more than Europe, more than Asia, more than Africa. And many of these uh, here foreign institutions are created and they never disappear. They're there, They're, they live on. There are the, so many ACLAC that was created at a moment when we thought we had to exclude uh, the US and Canada from, from the hemispheric forum when obviously, and as a senator just said, that is impossible for Mexico, at least for Mexico, that is impossible. So how do you view this uh, correction of our course for Mexico, for the region? Well, I'll start by saying that I totally agree with what Senator Monreal said in a small uh, citation. And that more, uh, but opening up the spectrum, it's natural. We'll face the same issues. We'll have uh, road problems, drinking water issues, airport issues. All countries uh, have the same issues, but they all solve them according to their circumstances, the political structure, their internal uh, dynamics. Uh, the Chileans, the law is the law. The debate of their uh, constituents that can be very complicated to implement. But the, the debate in Chile is really 
uh, a, a really a boiling matter because it's a reality in their life. We have a very distant relationship to the law. It's always been like that. Well, a bit more flexible. Yeah, more flexible. But this doesn't stem from our, this uh, current government. No, this stems from the past 100 years. Brazil, Brazil has uh, very strong institutions. In Mexico has economic institutions or at least uh, stronger economic structures that have been evolving. Every country has invested in different issues according to their history and background. But during the campaign, the president said there were four pillars to, for Mexico, poverty, inequality, corruption, and the low economic growth. These are still the four pillars Mexico has to solve. But the question is, how can we create the political structures to make it possible and to attain that? And the Senate is an example, as a perfectly vivid example on how to do it without any confrontations, without any strains of the relationship between all the social parties in the country. But we can also see in the uh, small font, uh, in Mexico, in these recent years, the pandemic, the decisions of the current administration have abated the uh, growth potential for years to come. But half of the country was growing at higher rates, over 4.5% 4, 4 for many years states growing at Asian-like rates, many states for uh, over 40 percent for over 20 years. So it's not true that the entire country is uh, poorly structured, but our distribution is very uh, poor. And I would uh, try to understand the politicians here. Um, much of uh, the constraints and the lack of growth in the South have to do with local political realities. If we see the Oaxacan uh, populations in Chicago and Los Angeles, they are as skilled, as smart, and as capable to carry out their work and to become uh, successful entrepreneurs like the people from Puebla and Zacatecas. But in Oaxaca, they have uh, much less opportunities. The question is why. We have local political circumstances that counter the development of people, their, their growth. If we look at recent years, uh, in, for the installation of energy compounds, renewable energy compounds, eolian and solar energy uh, compounds, we see that there is an intricate political uh, situation that is difficult to be solved. This is an evident um, situation. The past 40 years, there's been fundamental changes in the region in much more profound in Mexico than in other countries, stemming from the decisions of uh, getting closer to the U.S. economically and the uh, free trade agreement, because that uh, uh, created unique conditions inside and it trusts uh, levels that were never heard of again. And that uh, uh, entailed economic important economic growth in the country. But the thing that never changed, and that's where we should make the most effort in terms of the legal matters, the respect, abiding by the law, the first thing is that we never let down the political influence processes over the economic decisions. The privatization of companies how it was biased towards the privileged groups in time, and that is the way we preclude and prevent some companies to be successful and others are totally privileged. So these inequalities tell us, show us that there is no market that helps us uh, look into the differences. The fact that President Lopez Obrador was able to neuter or eliminate many of the institutions that were built during these decades only comes to show that the previous presidents just kept them and respected them because, uh, not because they could not eliminate them, but because they were supporting the powerful groups. And that's the only 
uh, issue where I, th that I would highlight. That's the only uh, uh, different opinion I would have from the senator. If the institutions are not sturdy, there are no institutions. If, if we cannot change the members of council, if we can just not name new commissioners or councillors in the uh, public administration office, or if we can mo modify the composition of the court so that the president can have a veto, uh, the power of veto. Um, but that, uh, that well, uh, Mr. Cidio could have done it, but he never thought about it. He did not have the capacity to think about it. But there are some weaknesses that we need to solve. What Andres just mentioned, we need to build the rule of law. We that that is key, and uh, that it's a lot more complicated than it seems. It's not only abiding by the law; it is creating the conditions, the necessary conditions. It's not only about people; it's building institutions. Uh, that uh, the, 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 the presidents cannot dodge in any way when they make decisions. And what we've seen is the extreme side of what we uh, have been doing in our history. So let's have a Q&A session. We, I have a question here. A senior advisor from Oxfam from London. And he says, uh, worldwide, the 1,000 billionaires of the agro-food industry have accrued their wealth during the pandemic. And most part of the producers and consumers are suffering because of the crisis. Bringing in more investment from these sectors, will we then benefit the, the populations from Latin America? How can we then uh, bridge these inequalities? I would have two comments on this. Yes, the agro-industrial sector, because this is an industry, of course, and this is being uh, seen as the birth of uh, agro-industrial complexes. This have ch has changed the face of the earth. And we do have much more population in the field than the countries that we are uh, developing uh, countries. And if we see the developing countries, you have to give a way out to these people to leave the rural areas through education, through employment, and uh, uh, becoming uh, users of the internet, things which are indispensable for the modern world. There is uh, less than 2% of the population uh, we're seeing has uh, live in these areas. In most areas, these are very, very poor uh, peasant workers. They have uh, mothers and fathers and relatives living in the United States, and they send remittances. And this uh, has to be seen under a different light. How can we promote uh, social mobility so that we can increase uh, uh, field uh, workers' mobility and have them join any type of the modern uh, working uh, activities of today. Yes, I believe. Well, I can tell you that in the past few years, the development of a protected agriculture in uh, agro-exporting developments, uh, I have seen them. I have been in San Quintin, I have been in Sinaloa, Sonora, Tamaulipas, and last week I was in the state of Jalisco in Tepatitlan. Why? Because I'm very interested in agriculture. The uh, producing sector of Mexico, this is one of uh, Mexico's goals to have uh, our own agro-industry. This year, we're going to export 17 million uh, tons of uh, uh, maize or uh, corn. This is not good. Uh, in Tepatitlan, I was very surprised uh, because of the organization of the workers, um, producers uh, of uh, 
hogs and uh, the development of the field. This, very, this is very impressive. We have to find a balance between and amongst the f factors or the values of work and employment have stability and also adequate income. There are there is no unemployment in that region. If there were employment, and that this is what uh, gives people good livelihood, this is what we should look for. I was uh, were I was very close to those who produce asparagus and berries and uh, the way they work the fa the fields, and I was greatly satisfied by what I saw and impressed uh, the way they work. In Latin America, is found between 36% and 40% of the 660 million that we are as a whole. Uh, 200 million, imagine that, are uh, found in the poverty sector. 10% of those 660 million concentrate practically 80, 80% of poverty. This is then something that we have to review in depth. I do think, and I know that there are solutions. I am one of those who thinks positively concerning this uh, uh, sector. I wrote a book uh, called Another Field is Possible, and it's the way I talk about uh, the uh, holding of land. We know that properties uh, such as in the states of uh, Chihuahua and Oaxaca, the, uh, their land was uh, partitioned. They have eight hectares, one hectare uh, to grow their products. It's very difficult to have scaled growth. Uh, their units uh, uh, to produce uh, are very difficult. They can't. Uh, have a, a more a better finance the livelihood, but there is a way to have a stronger industry, agro food uh, industry. And we have uh, examples of very successful cases. Thank you very much. We're going to have comments from those here present in the room. Please don't be shy. Ask your questions. This is going to be your only opportunity uh, to ask Luis and the senator. Hello, good morning. I am Ana Paula Dorica. I have your question here on my computer, Ana Paula, and I didn't want to address your questions because this would be a beautiful way to to close. Okay, so I won't ask anything about that question. Can I do something else? Yes. When you're speaking about Latin America diversity or divergence, what about the posture of uh, President Lopez Obrador, uh, the help uh, and support to Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba? How can we understand that? A president who constantly divides Mexicans can be or wants to be the standard of the Latin American Union. And so the question is for the three of you. Thank you, Luis. I, I will leave you the answer in your hands, Luis. I think that we don't need to interpret or overinterpret this. I think that there are two possible versions here. One is that these are the reflections of the 70s of the president, he feels that he, he can heat up the environment with his words. Cuba was uh, used by many governments as a mechanism in order to cer certain uh, sectors of Mexico. And the other part uh, is that I do think that there is a sign of distancing uh, between two politicians, distancing themselves from the U.S. and to be far away from the states. If this is healthy in the current 
scenario, if this has to do with the dynamics of the two countries, if this is going to help the president uh, uh, be successful, I'm going to give you a very small example, but I'll say the subsidy of uh, U.S. finance to il small electric cars can uh, affect greatly uh, Mexican exports. This is something that the U.S. government could easily, easily uh, handle. This is not a legislative matter. Uh, nevertheless, I cannot see how the U.S. government, in conditions such as these, do Mexican a favor or Canada by opening up this issue. So the dynamics that we have does not look like anything that we had in four or five uh, decades uh, uh, or years of realities in which the present, current president uh, lives in. I do, I do coincide with Luis and Paula, if you allow me. I think that this is a manifestation of a point of the six-year administration period in which we have had a president that likes to boast uh, uh, and brag about his positive relationship with our neighbor to the north and the political juncture in Mexico uh, with his eyes set on the uh, presidential succession where we have to solve some of the internal contradictions where uh, I'm sure the senator could uh, tell us about more broadly uh, inside of his uh, movement, Morena, which is the uh, movement for national renewal. It is made up of different pieces, heterogenic factions which were created or set up at the beginning of the campaign of uh, President Lopez Obrador. When supposedly he was going to win the presidency and that many people would get on the same train, people who had uh, different ideologies, ideas, etc. These included members of the PRI, PAN, uh, communists, etc. And uh, these uh, uh, ideas which are in, 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 imbued in the different parties still hold those beliefs. And now all of them are being clustered together uh, in face of the elections coming up. I, like Luis, think that uh, it's not good to help these uh, three dictatorships. This will not bring any benefit to Mexico, but obviously the president does think that for him, this is beneficial in order to consolidate uh, the, his process uh, of transformation of the country, which he wants uh, to uh, go beyond the six-year period of the administration. I, uh, uh, would you like to add something? I will let you know. I will always answer Ana Paula as I always do. I feel that the president wanted to recover a space which in the past just didn't take place. His vision towards the south where the presidents in the past did not have that gesture, a gesture of solidarity, of uh, coming together of 33 countries that belong to ECLAC, or that somehow embraced them. They had meetings here, like for instance, ECLAC had meetings here. And the president, since his campaign, he started to say that his eyes would look not only to the north, but towards the south. And this is something 
can happen. And the group of us who uh, belong to Morena, which is the majority of senators, is to are we're looking to uh, take up again the uh, importance of the South. Look to the South. If we did not do so, we said, the risks would be very high, and there would be a confrontation with the United States because we know the, the traditional history of the United States. It, it's called. Uh, it's written by Richard of Stater, traditional U.S. policy. Knowing and remembering this tradition, no one will feel comfortable if someone anywhere is a generating adversity to assisting uh, to uh, or being present in the coming uh, meeting in Los Angeles. I don't want our uh, relationship to be affected in any manner, certainly not an adverse relationship. I, like social democratic uh, countries, Norway, Finland, Sweden, I identify more with that type of left uh, wing, with that uh, left wing that has priorities for health, education, services, the environment, uh, etc. You were an ambassador to Sweden, if I remember correctly. So I share this vision much more, this modern left uh, wing, and not the kind of left uh, that we are referring to. I know them well, and I do know uh, the ideology. I'm aware of the ideology of the people that we're talking about. But I, Ana Paula, would be very cautious. I would be very careful because uh, uh, Americans do react. I hope and I'm hoping that we have good neighborliness and uh, uh, good uh, relations uh, between and among the three countries that belong to uh, our region and not to have any kind of uh, problems uh, looking to the south. We should have a forum where we can uh, talk about uh, the well-being of the 160 million people. By the way, one of the advantages that we have here in the South is that our age, age uh, average is that of 31 years old. The United States close to 40 age or age groups of these uh, and uh, 60 or 70 in Japan, 50 so much. So Mexico and America, Latin America I'm referring to, has an average age uh, uh, for the citizens is that of 30 years old. And that's an enormous advantage looking towards the future uh, for us to be in that age bracket. Yes, and now we have uh, comments by uh, Chatham House uh, Representative. Where is the mic? Where is the mic? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the comments. I have a question. Since this panel has, because of its contents, the idea of the public and uh, domestic pressures on uh, foreign uh, relations, there are different criteria in Latin America, different to those found in the United States and in Europe. I want to know what the uh, public attitudes are uh, that war, uh, Russia and Ukraine, has this in any way been uh, included in the formulation of Mexican foreign policy, policy and policies of Latin America? Uh, have you been discussing the quality of life of millions of people? Uh, the, some say this is the fault of Russia, 
and uh, others say it's the fault of Ukraine, that this is the extension of the Cold War. This is creating more divisions between the United States and Latin America, or does it have absolutely nothing to do? It'll just uh, pass and uh, will be forgotten. Thank you very much. We're going to put together two or three questions to be answered uh, later. Thank you. I agree with what has been said. How do we establish a policy uh, for the long range in infrastructure? How can we have better treatment from the United States? Uh, and how can we clean the jud judicial, the judiciary? They're small little questions, but they certainly are difficult to answer. Another one, anybody else from the room have any questions? Well, if there are no other questions, I think that we can answer these questions. Luis, would you like to start off? I would say three things. First and foremost, from the less Mexican form, uh, where we say you can't win it all, and knowing that Mexico is... Um, buying all the rides, uh, the issues of Cuba, Venezuela, uh, that of Ukraine in the, the Ukraine, is uh, to be on the best side. It's better to have a good relationship between and amongst all countries. It is not good for the duality to exist. It is something that this government is not ready to study, to contemplate, to recognize. It's natural for European countries who lived and experienced the World War II and who are part of NATO, and let's say Sweden and Finland, are particularly relevant in this case. These are countries that can see the threat that exists in the invasion of Ukraine, and they are united. Not many, many expected this, and there are other regions. Of course, I include other areas, but the perspective of other nations, it is that is more relative, that the U.S. has also done uh, other things, uh, terrible things, uh, uh, elsewhere in other countries. You can play if you have clear uh, rules of the game and not do things that are surprising to other go governments like this country is doing. The reason to have a relationship with the United States to have very clear uh, games, uh, uh, rules for the game. Don't uh, mix uh, up uh, one situation with other and uh, Let's not compartmentalize uh, the different issues. We have to see what the country is following, what rules. Sometimes uh, the answer is given by some countries. Rules are very difficult to follow because they are not followed by the country itself that is concerned. We shouldn't have things that are excessive. If I have a problems, and if I see that I cannot solve all the problems because of the complexity of this problem, if Mexico has not been able to have a different attitude, let's say regarding Venezuela, nothing happened. Mexico was very respectful of Cuba, different to what uh, the United States thought. The, the, the other countries were able to have fluid uh, relationship with country. We have to realize that this is a world power, that they are very important for us uh, in trade, etc., and that we're not always looking in the same mirror. There is a third question that Ana Paula Ordorica made, and I will answer it in order to conclude the panel. And if, if, if you were not the candidate for Morena for the, as a candidate for the uh, Morena party, would you accept any other candidate? for um, the Morena party to be the candidate? 
well, for me, in Ukraine, about Ukraine, for me, this is a war that never should have happened. It does affect us. We did depend largely on fertilizers. When we're talking about the Mexican field, uh, uh, the Russians uh, made prices uh, uh, very high. It does affect us. It has affected us. Um, but uh, this uh, takes me say how unfair the war is. Everything failed, diplomacy, um, talks, etc. This is a senseless war. It is a war of hatred. It is nonsensical, and uh, reconstruction of society will take ages. I am against it. And Mexico has maintained a position, a stance, which is more or less moderate. Sometimes you will find that there is autonomy, but it's not a very deep uh, type of autonomy. Juan Ramón de la Fuente said something a few weeks ago. And, uh, he was in the Security Council, but he went no further than to speak of, uh, of a very uh, institutionalized uh, relationship. This war has had as its effects and uh, the solution to the war will uh, take place in a long time, and the war will continue, this uh, invasion of Russia on the Ukraine. I think and I feel that this should have been prevented at all costs. Uh, it has consequences in the world over, and it can unleash uh, bigger, bigger problems if we do not use the uh, diplomacy, political diplomacy, much worse consequences in the United States and China. Why do I mention these two countries? Because if China enters into this conflict, there I am even more worried because of its military and nuclear uh, capability. It's much greater. Let's hope that the dialogue, diplomacy, can solve the problems. I think that this problem is indeed a very delicate problem. Regarding the other questions, which uh, were uh, very well answered by Luis, I think he did not uh, answer something, and I think I should bring it up. The judicial, the judiciary should uh, get uh, a big uh, slap in the hand. Mexico needs a reform. But there are Unfortunately, things such as corruption, uh, slow uh, solution to problems, uh, trouble, problems uh, with corruption. There are very serious problems in Mexico that have not been solved. And this is something that is still pending, still pending for the future. I have had conversations with the ministers, with the judiciary, from the le legislative standpoint. And this is one of the issues that we have not solved, and which I know will be very difficult to solve because the uh, because uh, uh, c corruption is uh, deeply rooted in many places. It's not generalized, I insist, there are uh, magistrates and judges that are are correct, uh, they're proper, but there are many problems in the uh, administration of justice, uh, in the uh, granting of, of, of justice, and all the processes involved in justice. Now, Ana Paula, what you want is for the uh, bull 
to get to my gut. Well, I, I haven't thought about the future. I am meditating deep. I am meditating deeply. Every day I build dreams. But what I can tell you and Ana Paula, and honestly, is that I meet with everyone. I have spoken to all the parties, the PAN, the PRI, the PRD, the PT. As a matter of fact, uh, I belong to all parties. I'm a par multi-party guy. I have uh, no story in my past that uh, can embarrass me. I went with the Senator Marine to Yucatan. People said to me, we are very conservative type of people. The PAN has governed here. Yeah, we all go to church, but all of us, mostly all of us, has a home away of home with another family. And they're not so conservative, okay? Get my point? Uh, I am a Marty, a, a multi-party man. I was also in the PRI. Uh, when I met President Lopez Obrador, I left the PRI. He, when he was president of PRD, he, he invited me to join the process. I have been uh, uh, with him in his uh, struggle for 24 years, and then I uh, joined the PRD. I was the representative of the government of uh, Zacatecas with the PRD, and there were 5% of uh, voters, 5% we were able to win with the support of the people from Zacatecas. Then I was in the PT, and then I was uh, in the uh, House of Representatives uh, for uh, Convergencia, and now I belong to Morena. So in my life, there have been five loves that I've lost. When I left the PS because uh, I left because they didn't let me participate as a candidate uh, for uh, as governor of my state, uh, they closed the, the process and they didn't let me get there. And nevertheless, I am quite calm. Perhaps at this uh, time uh, in my life, I am very calm. I am very serene because I can see what is happening in my country. I'm not, I'm not an uh, ambitious guy, but I'm not suicidal. I'm not going to throw myself off this HSBC building. I'm going to fight. I'm going to give I'm going to put up a good fight and I'm going to fight in a clean and fair fashion and I can beat them. And I can see that there can be an opening up uh, to uh, different opportunities and fair competition. I can I can win and I want to serve the country because I want to be president of the republic. You see? And even now, they're blocking me. They're not liking it because I will be the president of reconciliation. I will be the president of the reconciliation. I will be the president of reconciliation. I will be the president of the reconciliation, even if they don't like it. And I am 60. That is the true age of happiness. I'm 62, and I am uh, totally lucid. I am a Catholic, by the way. I am uh, that I, I believe in God. I hope I'll never get sick. But I am, I have a bright brain. I am so enthused, although I understand that all odds against are against me, and I understand how cold power can be. I have experienced it. I have experienced and lived. No, I, I, I won't keep talking. No, we were going to speak about the integration of uh, South America. So 
I'll stop at that. Thank you, Senator. So we and the panel in 15 minutes, we will listen uh, minister, we will listen to uh, Secretary or Chancellor Marcelo Ebrard. That is another uh, bottle cap. Uh, we can, you can ask him the same question, Ana Paula, in regard to his precandidacy. And thank you, Senator Monreal, most especially for accepting the invitation. Luis Rubio, a wonderful friend, a great political analyst of what happens not only in Mexico, but worldwide. Thank you for your attention, for your patience this morning, for your time. I don't know what's next. I think we have a short break. Please do not leave because we want to uh, resume in 10 minutes time at 12 sharp with a presentation of Secretary Ebrar. Thank you so much.